them transported to Buenos Aires National Wildlife Refuge. Um, most of you have visited the refuge, most of the viewers, but if you have not, I certainly invite you to go visit it. I am seeing a, a little message on my screen. I hope that's not coming through for everyone else. Uh, you are good. It, we okay. see. Yep, you're Excellent. good. Okay. Uh, Buenos Aires National Wildlife Refuge is a sweeping landscape of open grassland flanked by mountains. And it lies in southern Arizona, starting or the base of the refuge at the southern end is at the United States and Mexico international border. The refuge stretches 25 miles north and it occupies 118,000 acres. I'm going to provide an overview of the refuge as an introduction into um, the efforts to save the masked bobwhite quail. Okay. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is the federal land management agency that administers all of the national wildlife refuges across the United States. There is a network of 560, 570 or so national wildlife refuges that exist in all 50 states and US territories. And the mission of the federal agency, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, is to conserve and protect natural lands and the fish and wildlife and plants that occupy these lands. And this is not only for the benefit of wildlife, but for the American people or any other person who would like to visit these natural lands. Buenos Aires National Wildlife Refuge was established in 1985 with the primary purpose of protecting and reintroducing the endangered masked bobwhite quail. There are six or seven other endangered species or subspecies of plants and animals on the refuge. And you can't have uh, wildlife without habitat. So a major objective of Buenos Aires Refuge is to protect the semi-desert grasslands, the riparian areas of the refuge and the mountain section of the refuge. Most of the refuge is semi-desert grassland. This is an arid type of grassland um, that gets, oh, maybe 14 inches of rain a year. Um, it is the driest type of natural of grassland in the United States. If there was any less rainfall, it would be qualified as desert. And the rolling grasslands are flanked by mountains to the west and to the east. And the eastern section of the refuge has a couple uh, riparian or wetland areas. These are increasingly dry as our climate warms, but there still are um, some riparian habitat types at Aravaca Creek and Aravaca Sienica. And then to the west of the grasslands are the Babokavari Mountains. Uh, if you would look at a relief map of southeast, southern Arizona in general and southwestern New Mexico, you would see isolated mountain ranges that emerge out of the lowland desert or grassland. And these mountain ranges being isolated from other mountain ranges are considered islands in a way. They are islands in a sea of desert or a sea of grass. So the Babokivari Mountains is the westernmost sky island. The Babokivari Mountains emerge elevationally out of the grasslands. And um, as you would climb higher in the mountains, you would get into oak woodland junipers, and then on upward into uh, pine forest, higher elevations. 
Brown Canyon is a streamside watershed uh, in the Babakivari Mountains, and it is part of Buenos Aires Refuge. The refuge has miles of hiking trails and many, many miles of roads that you can drive. This is public land. That means this is your refuge. So you can come anytime of day or night. You can um, visit the refuge any day of the year. It is beautiful any day of the year, especially in the springtime. There are many species of wildlife on the refuge. Some of the mammals are restricted to um, the Southwest, Southwestern United States. This would include the javelina and the coati. One particularly interesting species is the antelope jackrabbit. It has huge long ears that function as heat dissipators. And the rabbit is known for its giant leaps and thus it is named the antelope jackrabbit. And speaking of antelope, um, the pronghorn is, an, uh, is a species of hoofed mammal on the refuge. It is in its own unique family, therefore it's not related to other antelope types, and it is correctly called pronghorn rather than pronghorn antelope. This is a species of special concern on the refuge. It, they have been reintroduced after being extirpated from southeast Arizona by the 1920s or 30s. Buenos Aires Refuge is known for its birds. There are over 340 species that have been documented. This includes the beautiful vermilion flycatcher, and in the grasslands and other habitats, you can find the loggerhead shrike. One of the special features of the refuge is that there are species of birds and plants that are not found much farther north. These are subtropical specialties that are more typical of subtropical areas to the south. This includes the beautiful black-bellied whistling duck, the gray hawk, occasionally a green, green kingfisher, and three fly-catching types of birds, two kinds of kingbirds and a little, little bird that has a very long name, the northern beardless tarantulae. But today we're going to talk about the masked Bob White. This is a critically endangered bird. Buenos Aires Refuge is the only place in, in wild landscape where you can find the masked Bob White, where you can find this quail. In fact, Buenos Aires is the only place in the country that has four species of quail. The others being the gambles, uh, Montezuma quail, and the scaled quail. This is a, a subspecies. The masked bobwhite is a subspecies of the northern bobwhite. Those of you who live in the east or the Midwest would be more familiar with the northern bobwhite. Here's the male on the right, female on the left. The masked bobwhite female looks just like the female northern bobwhite but the male has a black face or black cheeks, thus giving it the name masked bobwhite quail. In fact, in Mexico, it is called la mascarita, which means the little masked one. So today we will look at efforts to bring the quail back and to increase their numbers in their range. So I'm going to turn this, this uh, program over now to Lucretia Johnson. Lucretia is a uh, biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Okay, Lucretia. Okay, thank you, Bonnie. I'm going to start sharing my screen.
I'll let you know when we see it, Lucretia. I did double check and you are our co-host, so that's, <laughs> that's good. Do you need any help? So j just so you all know, as Lucretia is getting this going, she did, um, her power went out earlier today when we we're going through all of this. So there's a slight chance that there might be an issue there. And if so, then we'll turn it over to Rebecca. Oh, there we go. Lucretia, it looks like we can see you working on getting the PowerPoint set up. Okay, can you hear me now? I can hear you now, yeah. Okay. Okay, Luke, it's not giving me the share the share screen option. Um, well, you are, you are sharing your screen actually right now. Okay. Which screen are you able to see I, right now? We see your PowerPoint, but then with uh, like the document rec recovery over on the left and notes. And now we see um, your slide, but then we also see your next slide here. So um, it looks like you have it in a different display mode right now. So what I would do is probably, um, yeah, there we go. You got it. Okay, perfect. So thanks for that great introduction to the Refuge Fund. And, and I just wanted to take a minute and thank all of you that have taken time out of your day to learn about our efforts to establish a population of mass bob white quail on the Buenos Aires. Um, we have been working on this uh, for about four years. Um, if you have knowledge of the program, you know that the program actually has been going on much longer than that. But um, the efforts in which, that, uh, in which the speakers today have been involved with um, started about four years ago. So I'm going to start out with some similar information to what Bonnie was speaking to. Um, I'm going to provide you some basic information on the mass, Bob White. And, and so since its discovery in 1884, this gallinaceous bird has captured the attention of, of hunters, naturalists, conservationists, ornithologists, um, birders. Some of you are likely birders on, on on the presentation listening today. And I, I believe that part of its allure is in its colorful plumage. Uh, the male, as Bonnie was speaking to, has that beautiful black head and black throat and, and red breast. And I, I think that is part of its appeal. Um, the female coloration of this endangered subspecies of Northern Bob White, as Bonnie mentioned, um, is something you're probably a lot more familiar with um, because it looks identical to the females across the distribution of northern bob whites. And, and as far as the distribution goes for this particular bird, um, it has little fingers of habitat that stretched in to the U.S., um, so across this U.S.-Mexican border. Um, and then it went down into Sonora, and this is the heart of its range. And it went down um, south past the capital city of Hermosillo. And, and this bird occupies subtropical and semi-desert Sonoran grasslands. 
So the bird was extirpated from the United States by 1900 and experienced a dramatic decline in Mexico beginning in the 1930s. And today the mass bob white may be extinct in Mexico with the last confir confirmed sighting in 2006. Bonnie mentioned, you know, there might be a few individuals in Sonora um, and that's what that reference is to. Um, but again, it has been a number of years since we have had a confirmed sighting. And what led to this dramatic decline was incompatible livestock grazing practices as seen in this upper photo drought, invasive plant species, such as the monoculture buffalo grass seen here in the lower photo, and subsistence take may have contributed. And of course, unknown stresses may also have had an impact on this bird. So the mass bob white, as I mentioned, it's drawn significant attention, uh, not only because of its beautiful coloration, but also because of its colorful history. The one significant piece of that history is that in 1964, after 14 years without being seen by ornithologists, a, a wild population was rediscovered in Mexico. And this seminal event kicked off a suite of actions that without those actions, our work today would not be possible including a series of researchers being hired and their associated projects and establishment of a captive flock and the establishment of the Buenos Aires National Wildlife Refuge. So the early years of the program were science-based and, and led to the establishment of a wild population from captive stock within what is now the refuge boundary. But over time, biologists observed that there was a reduction in survival and, and they quickly adjusted for that. And they adjusted by making changes to the conditioning and release technique. However, today, when we review the literature, um, what we find is that the information supports that what was causing that reduction in survival was the continued cattle grazing at those sites. As we know, these birds, they, they cannot tolerate even light grazing in drought years, and at best, moderate grazing in, in years with significant rainfall. In addition, following the establishment of Buenos Aires, an aggressive fire program aimed at habitat restoration, so it was intended to be a positive thing, was initiated and, and, and it set back the secessional stage of large swaths across the refuge. However, these birds are a late secessional species and thus the population winked out and releases were then suspended in 2005 due to a lack of success. So in 2007, I was tasked with assessing the validity of the program and development of a new framework. So I began this process with a review of the available data and literature, both gray and peer reviewed, and, and then built upon that foundation by consulting with the Mass Pop White Recovery Team, along with my US Fish and Wildlife Service colleagues and wildlife professionals and naturalists that had a long history with this, with this bird or with similar species. And our conclusion was that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service should increase science and partnerships within the program. Luke spoke to the importance of partnerships when he was introduced in the talk today. Um, I agree with him 100%. We could never do this work without our partners. And uh, Tucson Audubon is a significant partner in this work. And so um, within, within um, the program, one thing that really needed to happen was we needed to uh, assess the genetic fitness of the captive population. And the conditioning and release technique developed back in the 70s should be reinstated. That was another determination. And it should be reinstated in almost its pure form. And then the conditioning and release um, uh, you know, should, should be post and pre along with habitat uh, restoration. 
And that restoration should follow a new prescription, one where fire is not the primary tool. And monitoring should increase and food plots and supplemental feeding should be part of the program. So with that framework, captive release is resumed in 2018. And that's why at the beginning of this, I spoke to the fact that we've been, we've been working underneath this new framework for about four years. Um, we're, we're into our fifth, fifth year in some components of it. And today, today the program is grounded in an ev evidence-based adaptive management um, that's informed by science. And Rebecca Chester has been involved with the on the ground implementation of this work since the beginning. And she is going to take our story today from this point. Thanks, Lucretia. Rebecca? Oh, there you go. Can you see it? Yeah, you're good. Oh, okay. Um, thanks, Lucretia, and thanks everyone for uh, having us here today and, and joining in this, this talk. So I'll start off talking about um, some of the things that make really good quail habitat. And there are different components, including low woody cover patches, um, preferably native bunch grasses, forbs, and also bare ground. And those different components are best for quail when they're on a small scale mosaic in the habitat every one to a couple of acres. Um, those components provide different things like escape and thermal cover, uh, loafing areas, food for the birds in the form of seeds and also green forage when uh, you're considering forbs. Um, and the forbs, a diverse forb, um, community also will support uh, insects, which are critical for the chicks during um, when they're young for the first month or so. So these are just some examples on the refuge of that uh, mixed mosaic of woody, um, low woody cover forbs and grasses on the refuge. There we go. So one of the products that has come out of the uh, last few years of work has been a habitat suitability index that was um, produced by Joint Fire Science within Fish and Wildlife Service. And it used remote sensing data as well as on the ground vegetation plots and ground truthed areas to predict where the better quail habitat is that includes a mix of the good woody, a diverse uh, uh, native grasses and forbs. And as you can imagine, and this is uh, part of the refuge, as you can imagine, a lot of that better habitat is along the washes uh, shown here in orange. And then the blue represents areas, um, sometimes those are area monoculture areas of like layman's love grass, one of the invasive grasses at the refuge. So this has been really helpful to help us understand refuge wide where our better areas are and uh, how to plan out uh, releases and, and habitat work. And speaking of that habitat work, one of the main things we do because we have an abundance of mesquite at the refuge um, different than it was 200 years ago is, is half cutting of the mesquite. And that's where we cut about halfway through the branch on mesquites that are maybe up to 10 or 12, maybe 15 feet tall, bend those branches down to the ground so that that cover is now low to the ground, which is much better for the quail when they're trying to escape predators. Um, so we've done quite a bit of that just to modify the shape of the existing mesquite, which is what we have to work with, that will then begin to mimic more of this low woody cover um, in the mosaic throughout the refuge in the areas that we've worked on. Another uh, technique that we've used to improve the habitat is uh, wash erosion control. And that's usually done by using uh, mesquite limbs or one rock dams to place um, kind of across a wash area. 
and that will slow the water flow, which will allow infiltration to be better, um, increasing soil moisture, and then that will in turn um, support better vegetation in those areas by having more, uh, more moisture in the soil. And we've been really lucky to have a lot of groups come out, um, Southern Quail Forever, uh, some youth groups through AmeriCorps and other Sierra Club. I think Tucson Audubon has also had a work day, but we've just had a lot of great, willing, wonderful volunteers to come out and help us with that habitat work. So those, we really appreciate all, everyone that comes out to help do that work. Now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about the process of uh, getting the foster parents for our release process. So we have several different techniques for releases. One of those is using foster wild foster parents um, to bond with our young mass bobwhite chicks and release them. So that process starts actually in uh, Texas and Oklahoma from January through the late winter, they, we have some wonderful uh, fish and wildlife co-workers um, in those states that trap northern bobwhite males for us and for a couple of months. Eventually, those, they make their way to the refuge in southern Arizona where they are vasectomized. And that is important to make sure that the um, closely related Northern bobwhite do not hybridize with female mass bobwhite. So after the vasectomies, the male, the male Northern bobwhites are taken back to their holding pens. And a couple months later, the mass bobwhite chicks, which are produced by in one of the, uh, one of our partner breeding facilities at Sutton Avian Research Center in Oklahoma, they start to arrive in batches starting in July. Um, we've been partnering this last year with Lighthawk, which is a fantastic conservation organization. They pair private pilots with conservation projects around the world. And we've been lucky enough that they have flown out um, all of our chicks this last year and we're looking forward to continuing a partnership with them. So the chicks arrive and they are paired with a dad. Here we have a northern Bob White and he is radioed so that once they're released we can keep track of the brood and learn about their habitat usage and their survival um, and just you know, increase knowledge in the program. So when we put them together we're hoping for a successful bond and a successful bond is when the dad accepts the chicks, he lets them get under him and he just kind of follows them around, keeps them rounded up and provides uh, thermal uh, warmth to them because they don't, they're not thermally independent until they're about a month old um, and just kind of keep takes charge of the chicks and that's when you have a successful bonding. Once we have a successful bonding, we move the brood out to the outdoors for the first time in the chick's life. They are getting exposed to dirt, rain, insects, plants, sky, wind, uh, you know, all the outdoor stuff, even in our, we call this a following pen that they go into, um, pictured here. They even get the sense of shadows of uh, predators flying above the flight pens at this point. Here we have one of our wonderful uh, Tucson Audubon contracted employees doing some work with this brood, checking the radio, it looks like, to make sure it works before we release. Sometimes the chicks don't always want to go in the box, uh, the release box right away. So here we have another Tucson uh, Audubon employee um, reaching in to get the last few chicks that didn't go in the box. So once we have them packed up and ready for release, that morning we have um, a number of volunteers that show up and we give them instructions on how to perform the release, a map, UTMs, and then they'll drive to the closest place they can and then get out and walk the rest of the way to a predetermined good habitat location on the refuge to set the box down, give the birds a few minutes to settle, then they'll go back and open the door so that the birds can emerge at their, at their leisure. Um, sometimes that happens within a couple of minutes, other times after 30-45 minutes the birds still haven't come out. They, 
you know, the chicks are still young, they're brooding, and especially after a little bit of a bouncy trip um, while walking out to their, their new home, um, they just take a little time sometimes to get comfortable with the idea of coming out of the box. But eventually they do, and here you can see a, a northern Bob White who has come out with his uh, chicks, and sometimes they spend a couple of minutes pecking around on the ground looking at the area right outside of the box and then usually they you know kind of slowly slink off into the grass and from that point on we track them uh, using the, the radio transmitters and telemetry to understand uh, where they move what they you know the areas that they're surviving in the best. I should mention a few slides back there was a mass bob white who was serving as a foster dad we don't always get enough of the northern bob white to pair with all the chicks. So we do use the mass bob white dads, uh, males also um, to perform that function. So some of the results that we've had in the last few years um, is that in 2018 and 2019, we had overwinter survival between 20 and 23%, which is on par with wild populations of bob white and that that was a pretty big success to have uh, so early on in the, the new effort in this program and shows that, you know, given the right conditions, these birds survive, can survive on par with wild populations, which is a huge thing for uh, chicks that were pen reared and um, the, the process that we're using to get them out into the wild. During that time, we estimated between one to 200 birds were in the wild due to those efforts on the refuge. Um, in 2019, we actually documented wild reproduction via uh, chicks that showed up on a trail camera. And then this last year in 2020, we were able to locate females, um, our first females with nests, um, do even, even in a year where the weather was historically bad, um, very, very hot, very, very dry. Um, it, to me, it's pretty impressive that we had females that were even able to lay eggs and had the patience to the ability to sit on those eggs and incubate. Some of the knowledge gained from this effort so far is that we, through the um, habitat modeling, the habitat suitability index, we have been able to identify areas that are termed quail ready. It has all the components in the habitat that the birds should need in, on a fairly small scale. Um, there's not a lot of acreage on the refuge in that condition right now. So we have also identified the deficiencies, but also the potentials for restoration um, on the refuge and plan to continue much more of that work into the future. We've also learned a bit about their movement potential and seasonal habitat usage, but as our telemetry data uh, compounds year after year, we hope to have more information about that and be able to better analyze where they do the best, what kind of habitat they prefer to have that feedback into our habitat uh, restoration uh, plans. We also have learned from this that the birds are genetically fit and can survive once released. That's been a question by some over the years because these birds have been captive stock for so many decades now. Um, so we have shown that they do have the they do have the abilities to survive on the landscape when the conditions are right. We've also had um, the the opportunity to make refinements in the conditioning process um, by taking. Uh, advantage of knowing a little bit more about their, their social behavior and physiology, we've been able to make refinements that um, will hopefully improve the bonding process as well as their conditioning and how they survive after uh, release. And then another thing that we've um, had indications of after the successes of 2018 and 2019 and followed by uh, poor condition, poor weather conditions or environmental conditions of 2020, it's uh, indicated the importance of supplemental feed for these birds, especially as we begin to establish, to establish in a population uh, starting with pretty low numbers. Um, then that just kind of helps smooth out the lows that are natural um, in, a, in a desert area where the weather can fluctuate um, between good years and, and really not good years. 
So up next is Don Wolf with the Sutton Avian Research Center, and he's going to tell you a bit more about um, how all these adorable chicks end up in Arizona and become part of our little wild mass bobwhite population. So Don, take it from here. Okay, thanks Rebecca and Lucretia and Luke and everybody. Uh, the, just a quick summary of the, or overview of the Sutton Research Center. Although since most of your, our viewers are from Arizona, we may not be familiar with this, but our organization, but we are uh, basically a, concert, a conservation research facility uh, that focuses primarily on rare and endangered species. And because of some of our previous successes, we were approached by the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And I'm not getting my, it's not, I'm not advancing here. Yeah, it's, I don't see it advancing. It did when we were doing it earlier. It did. <laughs> Don, I have to click on my screen where my slide is, and after I did that, then it attached, my, my arrows would react. Oh, gotcha. Thank you. Um, so, uh, but we were originally approached by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service around 2008 to uh, ask if we'd be inter uh, interested in be uh, getting involved in this, uh, in this particular program. Uh, however, at that time, uh, you know, there, there were the plans were that it'd be 10 to 15 years out before releases were they were ready to begin releases again. Uh, so really, we became pretty actively involved around 2014, 15, uh, and then thanks to a grant from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in 2017, we were able to uh, uh, renovate one, an existing building here uh, that and convert it over into the Bob White breeding facility. And we transported the first eggs from the Buenos Aires National Wildlife Refuge in 2017 that started our captive flock. Uh, and you know, 2017 also, there were a few birds released th that were produced at the Buenos Aires Refuge. And then 2018 was really the first year of larger scale releases. And that was the, the year that we were able to really start contributing uh, large num numbers of birds. As already mentioned by uh, Rebecca, you know, these are quail. They're low on the, now maybe they're, they're, they're a highly favored diet for many, a number, a large number of predators. And, you know, uh, typically with wild quail populations, only 10 to 20% of the chicks that are produced in a given year make it into, uh, into their first breeding season. And I just want to everybody keep that in mind because when you hear some of these numbers, you think, well, that's overwhelming. But the reality is that, uh, you know, we put a lot of birds out there, a lot of chicks out there for the few that do make it. Um, and in 2019, we received a private grant from a local foundation here that allowed us to renovate a second building uh, that uh, allowed, gave us a, uh, the potential to uh, increase our production by about 80%. And so for those first three years of releases, 2018, 19, 20, we've produced about 2,500 birds uh, for release out onto the Buenos Aires Refuge. Little overview on our facilities. Our our main quail lab, quail building, uh, it's about 5,600 square feet. We have a large lab service area where we're able to, uh, you know, care for birds that need special care, uh, as well as uh, the regular cleaning and maintenance operations. We have an isolation or what we call a hospital room where birds that are uh, needing special attention can be put in isolation and re receive medications or, or treatments. Uh, an incubator room, three brooder rooms for primarily are used for um, you know when we uh, for those birds that are not intended to go out and be released at two to three weeks of age, some that we have to hold back every year for uh, future uh, breeders. Uh, future breeders, and uh, uh, I don't know, another smaller, smaller lab area where we take care of all the necessary 
incubation and uh, brooding and chick care um, that needs to be done. And then uh, we also have 37 breeding chambers in the, our main building and then two what we call general population or reserve rooms that have the uh, capacity for well over 100 birds in each of those that are just held in, in reserve either as future breeders or for uh, really use as uh, uh, foster dads, et cetera. The second building that we had renovated in 2019 gave us an additional 30 more breeding chambers. So, uh, and then another smaller service room in, with, with that. So some of the general procedures here, uh, we monitor air quality daily because that's important. We have, we're, especially we were in, of course in a more humid environment than you used to in Tucson. So we have to be, always be on alert for uh, aspergillosis, which are basically it's a fungal disease that's caused by mold spores, which you would have in Arizona too, but maybe not at this high, this high density, but we monitor air quality on a regular basis every day to make sure that we are uh, keeping given the best air possible. We do weekly surveillance for diseases, uh, which essentially is collecting fecals uh, from their rooms, floating them in a, a, a special solution, and then uh, uh, examining that under a micro microscope to look for uh, coccidiosis or uh, the Ameria uh, oocysts or uh, eggs, eggs for roundworms. Any sick or injured birds that we have are immediately moved to isolation and treated until they're recovered and then put back into their either their breeding pens or their general population rooms. And we do a combination of what we call genetic pairs, which are birds that are based on the best genetics that we can have. You know, the, this, this male is made, best mated with this female to give us the most diversity. But in order to just to improve overall numbers of birds, we also do some clusters of three females to two males. And the, basically the criteria there is just that though, that those three females are gonna to be totally unrelated to those two males. And that just is another way that we can kind of boost the overall numbers of releasable birds. And so for example, in 2020, we had 54 genetic pairs and 13 breeding clusters, so essentially 93 breeding hens. Um, we pair birds up in April and they are uh, right away put on to a 14 hour photo period. We actually step that up. It's not a, a sun to 14, you know, from eight to 14 hours, but uh, we step it up to 14 hours. And then uh, we constantly are monitoring all the birds. And as these are arranged marriages, sometimes they don't work out. And it, typically the female is the, the aggressor and she will sometimes just, you know, it put, uh, put some validity to the old phrase henpecked. Um, and she will a lot of times become aggressive to the males, in which case he, he will usually start to cower in a corner and we start, you know, you know, start losing weight because he's not eating and will not mate with her. And when we, we see that happening, we immediately try to reassign a new pair so we're not losing out on that uh, production from that pen that year. Um, we collect the eggs twice a day and they're kept in cool storage for up to three weeks. And then every third week we incubate eggs. So, you know, when we, when we put eggs in an incubator, some of those eggs are only are only hours old since laying. Some of them would be up to three weeks of age. Uh, and then each egg is marked with a, a number from the pen that we came from. So we know who the parents were and also the date of collection. Uh, we weigh all the eggs before they're placed in the incubator. And then at, at a one week of incubation, we weigh them again and or a, a large subset of them at least to check weight loss is to make sure that we're, uh, our humidity is pretty much on track. Um, and then we also check, uh, candle the eggs and check for fertility at seven days. At about 20, at 21 days, the eggs are moved into a hatching incubators. And as in, you can see in this bottom left, uh, right slide, all the eggs of, from a single pair of birds are put into what we call little nest cups. Uh, and that's to assure that we know who the parents are from those birds. And uh, as the eggs are placed in those nest cups, we place them uh, wide end to wide end touching or the air cell end 
because of chick those eggs even at 21 days before they even pip are vocalizing and that uh, leads to because they are they're touching or in close proximity to each other that allows for uh, synchronization of that particular clutch of eggs so that clutch being four eggs that we selected from that pair and usually the um, in each one of those nest cups those eggs will hatch within 10 to 15 minutes of each other where in another nest cup and in the same tray, it may be an hour or two hours or several hours later or earlier. And at two days, we foster some of the chicks here with uh, some of our surplus males, it's, which are basically birds that we've held back from the previous year. Um, and then, uh, so we foster about a fourth of the birds here and then the about three fourths of them are taken out as chicks when they're two weeks old and then fostered with a northern bob white male as Rebecca has already discussed at the Buenos Aires refuge. And I hope that this video wor show works, looks like it's working on my end. Uh, this is just a, a few seconds of showing the uh, fostering process. In this case, these are two two day old chicks with a, a, a one year old male. Um, and as, as I've already mentioned, since 2018, we've really, uh, we've produced over 2,500 chicks to for release at, on the Buenos Aires Refuge. That doesn't mean that 2,500 were released because there are uh, always is some mortality or some weaker chicks that are decided not to be released after they arrive. And then each year we hold back about 50, somewhere between 50 and 100 birds that will, uh, as future breeders to replace our breeding flock or our aging breeder flock or to use as uh, future fosters. And uh, I don't know if we want to take questions now or afterwards, or uh, but maybe we best to wait for, wait till after. But I, the next person I think to speak is Paula Renninger, who's a volunteer at the Buenos Aires Refuge. And Luke, do you want to take yeah. questions now or wait? Let, let's wait for questions after Paula's done. Thanks so much, Don. That was really interesting. Yeah, uh, thank you, Don. That was super interesting. I'm a volunteer, and so I don't always get a window into all that information. Um, my name is Paula, and I would like to share just a little bit about the volunteer perspective of the program. I volunteer with a number of organizations, including both Tucson Audubon and Buenos Aires uh, National Wildlife Refuge. And uh, I'm super excited to be one of the newest members of the Arizona Master Naturalist Association. So I'm training to be a Pima Master Naturalist and I'm looking forward to upping my volunteer game through their program. Um, in the past, I've also worked as a certified veterinary technician. So the quail release uh, interests me both on the veterinary standpoint and of course on the restoration standpoint. And uh, fun Paul effect in real life, uh, my job is a professional flutist with the Tucson Symphony and the Arizona Opera. And you may not know it, but flutists always have to portray the birds, um, which is usually actually hard. <laughs> so I feel I am uniquely positioned uh, to be a quail releaser. And evidently I won the most enthusiastic volunteer award, which is why I'm lucky enough to join you all today. So I too have a few slides to share. Let's see if I can make that happen efficiently. And let me know when I'm there. Whoops, of course I started at the end instead of the beginning. There you go. Oh. Try it again. How about that? No, it keeps starting at the end. I would like it to start at the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> One third times. Third times the charm. How about that? Uh, there we go. All right. Yep. <laughs> so here is release day morning. 
And uh, first of all, I'd like to all convince you to volunteer. I'd like to convince you all to volunteer by saying what's not to like about getting up early enough to report for duty at the refuge at 0630 hours. Um, I will say that is not normal behavior for a musician, but there are a few things I'm willing to do it for, and this is one of them. It is so worth it. Um, if you like scavenger hunts or geocaching, you'll fit right in. You can see this screenshot and the purple points um, are the release points for my quail. And uh, one of the points is the designated release point. And you can see a little point behind there hiding and that was the actual release point. And what we did is we navigated, we kind of scrambled through the brush to the designated release point and looked for an, an area nearby that had some cover and some shade for them to jump into out of their box. And you'll see a few red points there too. While I was on the refuge, I decided to do a volunteering for Sky Island Alliance as well. So uh, we won't talk about killing two birds with one stone. <laughs> There's my beau. Uh, he in his kitted out Jeep and he's safari man there and he loves his toys and what a great excuse to deploy your toys. Uh, but know that you don't need the toys to volunteer in the program, but if you have them, it's a great time to use them. There's something so exciting about opening that little door on the quail box. And who knew that watching a box could be so thrilling, <laughs> but it is. It felt like it took forever for those little guys to run out, uh, but they did. And we did a great job at finding them cover because we did not get one good quail photo. Uh, but I assure, assure you, they did come out. We caught a little glimpse of the little, little peanuts on legs running out. It was just wonderful. Um, it is just, it's so rewarding to play a small part in what feels like the culmination of restoration efforts on the refuge. Um, and as you've seen, so much happens to prepare for the release. Um, from the habitat restoration to all the work that goes into raising the quail and getting them there. And so it's, it's such a joy. I feel like I'm cheating. You know, I just get to stroll in and open the door <laughs> and the fun begins. Um, but it really is a special, special moment. And um, we were just thrilled to, to be part of it. And then, of course, I always encourage everyone to take the long way home. We had a lovely, lovely drive through uh, Ruby um, to get home. So uh, I'll hand it back to Luke to field some questions. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Paula. That's great. You know, it's always good to get uh, everyone's perspective uh, on this. And so it's good to have so many people involved. Lucretia, Rebecca, Don, Paula, Bonnie for starting us off. Uh, so thank you to all of you. We do have a, a few questions that we could uh, get to here. Um, Ricardo asked, how many mass bob white have been released over the decades? Anyone know that? I, I could take that, Luke. Yeah. Um, this is this look, Krista. Uh, so what we do know, you know, we do, we do have some records and we know that from 1984 to 1994, um, there were about uh, 17 to 18,000 released, and there's been several thousand since that point. So we're up into the, the 20,000, 30,000-ish uh, numbers. But I don't want that to um, discourage people or give them a negative feeling about um the program, that's a lot of birds to release. But remember what I said in the presentation when I spoke to the fact that we've learned as we've progressed. And um, one of the big factors that we learned is that we need to uh, implement habitat restoration uh, in a different way. Uh, we need uh, to approach that in a more appropriate way. And we need to include some, some aspects of the program that hadn't been completed, uh, included in the past um, such as food plots and supplemental feeding to stabilize that population as we grow it. And the successes that um, Rebecca spoke to with survival in line with other wild populations, 
Um, that is truly uh, nearly unheard of for released gallinaceous birds that, that are of the quail variety. So we're on to something here. So just hang with us and be optimistic with us. And I think we'll see some great things. That's great. Um, so when it comes to habitat restoration techniques for mass bob whites, um, what your use of fire or not using fire for those, Paula had a question regarding that. Yeah, um, so my understanding is that the for the semi-arid grasslands fire is kind of the normal um, process. So I was really curious to hear more about why um, that didn't work out. My understanding is that the fire keeps it from turning into a brushland. Um, so I, I'm, I'm curious to hear more about that. Yeah, so the fire question is very, that's a very complex issue. And um, you're correct. We, we don't want the landscape completely covered with mesquite. But it is in the way that the fire was applied originally uh, when the program started in 85. It was, it was uh, applied in a way that it burned across the entire landscape. So it burned down into the washes uh, as well as the uplands. And we don't want those washes to burn uh, because uh, these birds again are a, a late successional species. And in, in this environment, it takes a long time for, for that shrub cover to reestablish. And the other issue is that on Buenos Aires, we have layman's love grass, an exotic invasive grass. And what the research that we've done over the last few years has shown is that, that fire increases the, the prevalence of the love grass. So initially when we burn, we see an increase in native forbs and grasses. But within three years, that area that burned will have just as much, if not more, layman's love grass than it started with. And so, so it is a way we can set back succession and have some positive outcomes in the short term. And so it's not that we don't want to use fire at all. We do have specific places on the landscape that it's very useful to use it in relation to quail habitat development or restoration. But we just need to be smart in how we apply it. Keep it out of the washes, um, areas with heavy uh, love grass, that is a great place to apply it um, because, you know, you can't make, make as bad as it gets any worse. So um, it's a way to knock that back and improve it. So there are some ways we can use it. We just, and, and we do, we just have to be smart about it. More strategic than we were in the beginning. That's great. Thank, thanks for that information. Uh, Tom was wondering, he's been seeing a lot of Gamble's quail his last few visits out to uh, Buenos Aires. Do they share the same sort of habitat preference as the mass bobwhite? Is there any um, competition there? Do you guys want me to take that one? Or does somebody else want to take it? Rebecca, you want to take it? Sure. So, so yeah, there, there is definitely some overlap between all four of the species, actually, of quail, as uh, Bonnie was mentioning earlier, that are on the refuge. Um, there is some a little bit of overlap with each of them. Um, but the, the gambles seem to, it, there, there is the most overlap with gambles, I think, between mass bobwhite and, and another quail species. At this point, I don't think there's too much competition just because there's you know a low number of mass bobwhite out there right now. Um, but from what I understand from hunters and people previously, the numbers of gambles quail, you know, is probably uh, across all of Arizona, their numbers have gone down as well overall. So the the population of gambles at the refuge was probably uh, higher and, and scaled quail also um, was probably higher in the past. So we have a few other questions, just a couple more minutes here, I think. Uh, so let's see what we can get to. Lauren asks if there's any problems with mass bobwhite chicks imprinting on the northern bobwhite foster parents and then not breeding with mass bobwhite quail at maturity because they think they're northern. Is there? That's something that issues? people 
have um, been, you know, that was raised as a concern, would that happen? And we've, we've got, we've got evidence that, you know, sometimes they do, if a Northern Bob White dad is alive long enough, as we start to see the, the chicks mature, sometimes they have a female mass Bob White has been spotted with a Northern Bob White a couple of times the next season, but they've also been seen with mass Bob White. So I don't, I don't know if it's a matter of imprinting, but when the population, when the numbers are pretty low, it might just be a matter of that happened to be one of the other quail in the area and they were just hanging out together. So if you, if you think about a bird, they, they see the parent and it might be a Northern Bob White, but they're also seeing all of their brood mates and those are all mass Bob White. So, so even at a young age, it's, it's, it's not just seeing the parent, it's seeing its broodmates as well. So that, that's something that we should probably look into a little bit more as time goes on and see if we can really track to see if that is any kind of issue. But right now we don't think it's a, an issue. Because there, and there's also a very limited number of those Northern Bob White at the refuge. We only, they're only one dad per 15 or so chicks. Um, so there's really, by the time breeding, the next breeding season comes along, there's not really many of those uh, Northern Bob White dads still around. Right. I'd like to add something there too. This is Don. Uh, yeah. With uh, precocious birds, uh, imprinting it really seems to be very minimal. As, uh, those birds that are uh, dependent on parents for a longer period of time, imprinting seems to be a major part of that. But with birds that are basically hit the ground running, uh, they seem to know that's what they are. Uh, that, that's contrary to what your Saturday morning cartoons used to teach us. <laughs> but you know, but the real biology is that you know most precocious precocial birds are in, imprinting is very minimal if, if it exists at all. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. Uh, our, there's so many good questions here. I'm trying to. <laughs> uh, are mass bob whites being seen by what? How often do you see wild birds at the refuge? Like, uh, I know I've been out there a few times. I've never seen any. Uh, there's a few questions here about what are the chances of seeing any out there. The the staff and the field techs see them probably more than anybody else because you know we're tracking them with telemetry so we're near them on purpose um but there have been a few times where again we're in the area where we've done real in the general area where we've done releases just driving down the road and you know we'll see them cross the road or or scooting along the road for a few feet i was on my way to work about a year well eight ten months ago on Highway 286, and I saw a male and female crossing the highway. So it's luck, um, right? It's, yeah, <laughs> a little yeah, bit of luck in there. Right, it happens. Um, yeah. There are some, there's a, a little uh, group of birds right around the headquarters lately. So, you know, your chances, they're elusive birds. So even if we had, chances are, if even if we had a good population, big population of mass bob white on the refuge, they're not going to be extremely obvious because that's just not the type of bird they are. So yeah. it, it is possible for people. It, it's a, it, but if you see one, consider yourself pretty lucky. You've been in, you were at the right spot at the right time watching for them. Yeah, that's, how, that's to, how I feel about Montezuma quail too. Yeah, you know, look, you just hit it. You hit the nail on the head right there. Um, they're very similar to that. They're very, um, they're secretive birds. Um, similar to Montezuma, so they're they're difficult to spot. But I just wanted to add to what Rebecca was saying and um, let folks know that we are trying to um, construct habitat improvements around the headquarters area to improve visitor experience. And part of that improvement is um, it, to increase the probability that uh, you will have an opportunity to view these birds in the wild. Um, right now, if you come out to the refuge to see them, um, you can see them in a display pen close to the headquarters, but we'd like you to be able to experience them um, in, in their natural setting. You mentioned supplemental feeding, or someone did um, in, in the presentation. 
And so th there is a question about what, what does supplemental feeding look like? Uh, yeah, and how, how much do you do? So you can do, uh, there's two different uh, types that are common. One is um, uh, supplemental feeding through dispersing the food. It's called broadcast feeding. You can use um, different types of equipment to, to disperse it, kind of like uh, uh, seeders that you might use to seed a lawn, um, but on a larger scale. Um, and then there's also stationary feeders. And um, the type that we use um, are, are called barrel feeders. And um, uh, actually we have, we have one of the people that um, leads that work, um, I see, I see him and I just wanted to take a minute and say hi to him, it's Jim Levy. And the reason I wanna say hi to him is you guys might've noticed his name um, when I went through my presentation. He is the gentleman, he is one of the three gentlemen responsible for the rediscovery of this bird in Mexico in 64. And I, Jim, will you just wave to everybody, let them know who you are? Are you comfortable with that? I think he may have left. Hey, he's there. He's there. Thanks, Jim. I think he's trying to figure out how to unmute. <laughs> Anyways, we're, there he, there's his wave. And I, just, I saw I just the wave. To, I saw the wave. I just want to kind of get him spotlighted <laughs> because um, we owe a lot to this gentleman. Yeah, that's great. Hey, we, we I think... Two more questions. So, well, Larry mentioned something about grazing. I think that was an answered earlier that there's no grazing happening on the refuge anymore. Maybe correct me if I'm wrong there. Um, but two last questions, one from Bonnie. She asked if there's any cooperative efforts with Sonora uh, that's going on between um, the, the birds in Sonora and us. Silence means maybe no. There oh, there is. I'm, I'm oh, sorry. Could you, I, could you ask that question again? I you broke are, up for me. Oh, sorry. Are there any cooperative efforts with Sonora, Mexico? Yes, um, there there are some. Um, it back in in 2016. Well, it, it goes back further than that. So there's a few different efforts going on. One is. Um, in the last decade, we've established a captive facility in Mexico um, at Africam Safari, it's near Mexico City. Um, another is in 2016, we uh, initiated a research project on the Camus ranches and that um, project was looking at the status of mass bob white. So we were basically searching for wild birds. Um, and in that ranch that I'm speaking of, it, it is where Jim located those birds in 64, and it is the last known location for mass bob white in Mexico. And um, we are currently working with folks in Sonora to establish a captive facility there so that they can lead their own effort at reintroducing the mass bob white into Mexico. That's awesome. Last question. I know we have quite a few people who are who have volunteered uh, out there at the refuge, and some folks who have, like Paula, been able to release some of the mass bob whites. And uh, if if you're one of those people, maybe just put something in the chat to say, "I volunteered." It'd be great to see how many different volunteers we've had out there. Uh, but someone asks, "Who would I speak to about volunteering at the refuge?" That's a great question to end with. Who would they speak to about that? So um, if you want to volunteer with the program uh, specifically, um, uh, I, would, I would say um, that, that Rebecca would be a good contact for that. Um, so if you're looking to volunteer for Quell, I, I would reach out to Rebecca and, and um, she can certainly get those wheels in, in motion. If your goal is to volunteer on project, projects in general, um, Bonnie, would they reach out to you or is there a, a better contact right now? 
our volunteer coordinator is not um, in, uh, we are, that position is vacant currently. So I wanted to reach out to Bonnie and see if they have a process for that. Um, that would be fine to contact me. I used to be the volunteer coordinator, but right now the position is, is vacant. Um, we also, it, yes, if you can put my contact information up or if it can come later with the link that um, Luke will send out, I can refer you to whoever can get you going with volunteering. Uh, the Friends group, the Friends of Buenos Aires, uh, has work projects on the refuge throughout the year. So that would be another organization to contact. Great. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so if it's all right, I'll put Rebecca and Bonnie's uh, their Bonnie. contact information there if you want to vol volunteer. Luke, you could add my name also. I've been connecting a lot of recent volunteers with Visitor Center and Water on the Landscape and some water defense removal. Um, so Bonnie and I can kind of divvy that up once we get in tape. Okay, and I didn't catch who was talking there. <laughs> was Rita. That was Rita. Oh, okay. All right. That's we'll do. Thanks, Rita. Bad. All right. Well, hey, thanks to all of you who uh, who joined us, and special thanks to Lucretia and to Don and Rebecca and Paula and Bonnie and Janine Higgins, who helped set up so much of this. Um, I don't think I left anyone out. There's just so many people who are involved with it, and uh, and that's what makes it pretty special. So, um, how about uh, any last from our any last thoughts from our presenters before we head out? I I think it's just great that everybody joined. I really appreciate everybody taking time on a, a snowy well, not so much snow anymore, Southern Arizona day to to listen to the project. And thanks for your interest. Yeah, feel free to unmute yourself and uh, it's always, you know, we got the the clapping and all the virtual stuff, but it's good to hear a voice to saying thank you. So go ahead and unmute yourself and give our presenters some love and then we'll head out. Thank you, thank you John. Awesome thank job. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. Thanks for sharing the information. Super. Thank you. Thanks so much. Fascinating information. Take care. Bye. All right. See you guys later. Thanks again. Right. Thanks a lot. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.